of you probably have had birthday candles lit for them once upon a time, sometimes very recently. And when you extinguish it, you see this little poof of smoke coming out. That is combustion. You light fire and you have things coming out. If things go to completion, you're going to get carbon dioxide and water. If things don't go to completion, you end up getting carbonaceous particles. You start getting soot. You start getting this black carbon, which the previous speaker was talking about in terms of uh, what was coming down on the roof and making it dirty. So we at the lab are interested in seeing you know, how we can mitigate this, how we can change this, how can we improve burning. You think it's a very, very simple problem. So the graph I show you out here, this comes from uh, statistics that has been put together by the US government. Basically what it's showing you is from now up to 2040, most of your energy use is going to be natural gas, like it or not. And out of all of that, most of it is going to be in freight trucks, which is going to be transporting your iPhones, your iPods, your things from here to there. And what it is doing while it is transporting this, it is emitting soot, black carbon, this stuff from the back of the tailpipe. So a big interest in the lab nationwide is this whole idea, you know, can we make cleaner burning engines? One, improve efficiency. Second, remove the sooting particles, which are both detrimental for the environment and for your health. And so the little story I'm going to tell you today is essentially how we are going to probe this using a particle accelerator up at, the, up at Berkeley. So when you burn something, when you burn a fuel, when you take something called gas, and you put it into your engine, it starts out with these very, very small molecules at the bottom, and then very quickly it starts making this what are called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and then at the top, you end up getting your little particles. This is what you see from a diesel engine. People actually use this to make materials. They burn different kinds of chemicals so they can make things like nanotubes and graphene and other, again, very, very fancy materials which end up, again, in that ubiquitous iPhone that you're carrying around with you. Or a light composite material which goes onto a plane that you're going to fly in the very near future. And if you are in Berkeley and Oakland, you might also want to use a light bicycle. Again, a lot of these materials come out of combustion processes. And finally, something that is near and dear to all of us, we want to understand where we came from and where we are heading. And the idea here is, again, a lot of these processes are implicated in the origin of the solar system. How did, when you start out from the Big Bang and you head off down, you start making molecules, you start making DNA bases, et cetera, and you end up sitting here in this auditorium in Oakland. So this is the particle accelerator that we have on the hill. It's a beautiful view out there. Most people project onto San Francisco. I choose to project towards Oakland. Remember that. <laughs> so out here, we have a particle accelerator, we have electrons, tiny, tiny bits, which are going around at almost the speed of light. They're spinning around really, really fast. As they spin, they give off energy in the form of light, all the way from the X-rays to the terahertz, to the infrared. And each one of these lines showing out here has a few people, has an experiment going on 24 hours a day, six days a week, Monday is our holiday. And as you turn around, this ring, you're going to see that people are looking at different things which are all about solving both our energy problem and, and mitigate and the mitigation of what it does in terms of solving our environmental problem. We're looking at things like catalysis, we're looking at things like solar fuels, etc. The reason all these people come to the synchrotron is shown in this one little chart. So sun is down there somewhere. This is like how intense the light is the sun is projecting out. But if you focus that down into a tiny, tiny speck, the size of your human hair, say a few microns, you're going to get what is, the, what is the brightness that is coming out from the synchrotron itself. And that is shown way up there. It's 10 orders of magnitude. And then for those of you who talk about, don't think about orders, this is like 10 zeros between the sun and what the synchrotron is giving you. And behind that, we do a whole bunch of chemistry. So things like we take a real flame and we analyze what are the chemicals that are coming out of there. We look at this. This is, again, another beautiful picture taken from the same vantage point. This is one day when the space shuttle was making its last uh, 
journey home, out here you're seeing San Francisco. This is not fog, this is smog. Groups at our beam line up at the ALS are again studying the chemistry that is going on in these atmospheric processes. And again, combustion and environment, they're all implicated. The molecules are the same, they just keep on turning around. We also use the same light to look at things like DNA bases and such like that. This is our Dali-esque rendition of what the DNA would look like upon ionization. And again, we also do things like cosmochemistry, looking at the origins of uh, the solar system. So the experiment today, in the two minutes that I have remaining, I want to tell you about, has been done by these two Australian fellows, postdocs, and uh, Tyler and Dan. And this is a little, little instrument. It's only about yay big. This thing is about one centimeter long. It's got a one millimeter diameter. We put voltages here. We heat it up. We heat it up to 1,500 degrees Celsius. We make it really, really hot. And we pass a gas through it. The gas starts changing. It reacts. We analyze the products that are coming out using the synchrotron. And this is essentially what we're doing with our experiment. We have this hot nozzle. We are passing gas through it. And what we're doing is we're making the phenyl radical, C6H5. So this is one of the radicals which has been, a radical is something that you removed an electron from. This is something that has been implicated in making these sooty particles right from the bottom up, postulated almost 40 years ago. But nobody has seen it experimentally. So we make one of these guys out here. We react it with acetylene, C2H2, a very simple hydrocarbon. And then they come shooting out really, really fast, faster than anybody who can run, 1,500 meters a second, really, really fast. And then the synchrotron zaps it, removes another electron, and these guys start flying up into what is called a time of flight mass spectrometer. The slow guys, the fatter guys make it slower. The light guys make it faster, it's time of flight. And what I'm showing you out here is the light guy. This is phenylacetylene. is making it out here around 100. The heavier guy, naphthalene, is making it there at around 120. What you see out here is the first ring formation. Two of these guys have come together, and uh, that is just right timing, <laughs> because this is my last, last slide. And this is what we are showing out here, that we have shown, using this particle accelerator, one of the first beginning steps of how soot particles form in flames. Thank you.